Matt, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Matt says, um, the Stamp Out Scab campaign has been running. It's an RDPE-funded project that's been delivered by ADAS um, as an awareness campaign for sheep scab with the hope that perhaps there might be some money, some further funding for um, some more sort of um, practical work with scab going forward, but that's an unknown at this point. But um, if I could just ask everyone um, if um, it will be possible that they could maybe fill in a feedback form uh, after listening to the webinar, uh, just that the whole project is based on um, training delegates and training hours. So uh, we need to report feedback back to uh, DEFRA uh, to get funding for the project. So just to start with a little bit of background on SCAB, um, and the history in uh, Great Britain. Uh, sheep scab was eradicated from Great Britain in 1952, but reintroduced with imported sheep in 1973. It was then made notifiable and remained notifiable until 1992. And during that period, um, compulsory dipping was in place. Uh, it started with a double dipping program, uh, summer and autumn dipping. Uh, that was in place until 1988, when it was reduced to single autumn dipping. Uh, and as I say, sheep scab was deregulated in Great Britain in 1992. So this graph, um, if you notice on the vertical axis, it's a um, log scale, uh, but is showing the number of outbreaks uh, since um, scab was reintroduced in 1971-72. Um, and how it sort of tickled along um, at around 100 outbreaks a year until deregulation when it's just an exponential rise in the number of cases. And that's only up till 2005. And my estimate would be it's been increasing considerably even since then. Uh, so uh, the regulation in place now since um, deregulation in 1992 in England and Wales, uh, it's governed by the sheep scab order, under which it's an offence, a criminal offence, if owners or keepers of sheep fail to treat sheep visibly affected with sheep scab and to treat all other sheep in the flock, or to move sheep that are visibly affected with sheep scab except for treatment or for immediate slaughter. Different situation in Scotland where um, the sheep scab order was, Scotland was introduced in 2010, whereby um, scab is now a notifiable disease in Scotland. So this means um, that all cases of sheep scab or, and this is perhaps a difference with England as well, suspected sheep scab. So if sheep are suspected to be affected by scab, um, it's notifiable to DBM. Movement restrictions are then applied to the affected flock. There's a requirement for the keeper to um, consult a vet to uh, make a diagnosis and establish if sheep scab is actually present. Um, diagnosis is currently free with SAC. Uh, the neighbours are notified, um, and if sheep are grazing, affected sheep are grazing common land. Common land is cleared, and if there are sheep left that are um, not claimed or owned, then um, the authorities have the right to uh, remove slaughter those sheep. This graph, um, don't worry too much about the numbers, they're pretty small, but basically it's just showing the number of premises um, with sheep scab that have been um, officially notified between December 2010 and uh, December 2012. Uh, the lightest yellow is um, no cases with the, the dark red. Um, between 20 and 51 cases in that two-year period. So it's really just to show that um, you know there still is there's a lot of scab being reported in Scotland, and obviously we know there'll be a lot more cases that aren't actually being um, notified. Um, I don't have a similar map for England, but um, well, I um, am in practice in Herefordshire and. Uh, in the last probably 18 months, I've seen a massive increase in the amount of scab. It really is um, extremely uh, prevalent there now. 
Uh, this slide um, shows the uh, results of some work done by Richard Wall and colleagues at Bristol University where they looked at risk factors uh, for flocks that um, got scab and I think the findings really uh, are what we probably expect that if um, a farm has neighbours who regularly have sheep scab there's a um, tenfold increase in risk that they will get scab. Uh, if there is regular contact with a neighbour sheep because of poor um, boundary security, it's about eight times increased risk of getting scab. And common grazing, once again, um, is about a ten times uh, increased risk of getting scab, um, which all things we would expect. And perhaps I think another one we could maybe add in there, um, I think buying in sheep would be another major risk factor. Uh, this is also work done by um, Richard Wall at the University of Bristol and is looking at um, flocks that have had, reported they've had scab, how many um, previous outbreaks of scab they've had. And I think um, one notable feature there is uh, if we look, only 15% have never had scab previously. So that means that 85% of people who reported a scab outbreak in the previous 12 months had had scab before, and some of them have had scab um, 10 times, 30% have had scab almost every year over the last 10 years. Uh, and that would um, agree with my experience, actually, that uh, the problem is the flocks that, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later on, whether it is that they keep picking up scab or, more likely, they never really get rid of the scab. Um, and these are the real problem farms, really, for control of scab. Here we've got um, some um, uh, photos, magnified photos, obviously, of the um, sheep scab mite. Seroptes ovis, uh, male on the left and female on the right. Um, obviously, you see the female, she's got a single um, egg there. Uh, this is an electron micrograph of the um, mouth parts of the, um, the mite. So you've got the, um, the mouth parts here, and in between these calicery, which um, act to abrade and scrape the skin um, to get the debris that they, they eat. But they don't actually penetrate the skin. They're just abrading the surface and irritating the surface of the skin. Uh, this is a picture of a, an early um, sheep scab lesion, uh, magnified, so you can see these pearly white dots are actually um, sheep scab mites. Uh, I think if you've got very good eyesight, you can see uh, scab mites with the naked eye. Uh, I know that I can't. Um, but this is typical of an early case in that uh, the wool hasn't started dropping out yet, but you've got this um, scabby sort of exudate here. Uh, the damage the mites cause is partly due to the, the calicery abrading and, and rubbing the skin, um, but it's predominantly an allergic reaction to the um, feces of the mites that causes the intense irritation um, to the sheep. Here there's a graph to show, or a diagram to show the um, life cycle of Seroptes ovis. Uh, so we have the female laying an egg uh, that hatches within one to three days, depending on um, temperature and conditions, into a larva that then molts uh, a further two times before it becomes an um, adult mite, uh, with two to three days between each molt um, period. The importance of, um, sort of understanding about the life cycle is that when the mite is molting at these stages, they're not feeding. So when treating with um, products that have no persistency, uh, the mites are not feeding, may not take in sufficient of the drug to kill them, which is why you need two injections. Um, products that have no persistency, as we'll um, come on to later. Uh, this is a picture of a... Um, a lamb that's quite severely uh, affected with scab. So you've got uh, areas of wool loss. Um, 
and the, the animal obviously was, well, not obviously, it was also very um, itchy, uh, positive nibble response uh, when you handled it. Um, this graph shows um, time along the bottom axis in days and numbers of adult mites on the vertical axis with a um, log scale again. Uh, and you'll notice that for the first three weeks, um, mite numbers barely increase at all. They're increasing very slowly. Um, and then there's a rapid um, increase in numbers, an exponential increase in numbers. Uh, the mites, female mites, only lay a single egg every one to two days. So that sort of explains why the population takes a while to increase, but then rapidly takes off. So it's really sort of um, six, seven weeks before you reach maximum uh, mite numbers when you start to see clinical disease. And this is a really important uh, factor when it comes to, um, say, buying in sheep because farmers may um, follow a, a quarantine uh, protocol and um, they may not uh, treat the scab when they come in, but they think, well, I will keep these sheep separate for three weeks before I mix them with the main flock. But in that three weeks, if the animals have only just picked up scab, uh, mite numbers still, will still be very low. Uh, you'll see on the next slide, uh, lesion size pretty much follows uh, mite numbers. So there's next to no lesion in the first three weeks. Then it starts to increase slowly. And it's only after about seven to eight weeks that you've got a significant um, lesion there to see. So as I say, farmers might bring in sheep infected with scab um, they don't know about. And it takes seven, eight weeks, perhaps more, before they're aware that there's actual um, disease in the sheep. And, uh, and this lag phase does vary as well with um, breed of sheep, wool type, um, whether the sheep have had uh, scab before. So it's pretty variable, but just I think the main factor to realize it can take a long time between picking up the mites and disease to be evident. So in the first few weeks after they picked up um, scab mites, there may be minimal lesions or wool loss or anything, but animals will start to be um, irritated. They'll be rubbing, nibbling themselves, restless, and you'll start to see um, tags of pooled fleece. Once we're getting into the um, clinical disease phase, so mite numbers are now high, and you'll start to see lesions. Uh, the signs are extreme restlessness, rubbing, nibbling, often staining the wool because the animal's been scratching with its feet um, and rubbing against things. Uh, a progressive scab lesion, so a scab lesion tends to start from a, a focus, a point source, where the mites first uh, made contact with the skin and then to spread outwards. Uh, significant wool loss, in some cases, you don't always see uh, a great deal of wool loss. Uh, nibble response um, is pretty consistent sign when you find the lesion and handle it, the lips start to go. Uh, occasionally, the irritation to the sheep is so severe that it will induce um, epileptiform type seizures. Uh, loss of condition, uh, initially because the animals simply aren't feeding, um, but then you will get, if you get very raw open lesions, which can occur, there's going to be protein loss as well. But um, loss of condition can be uh, very severe in case of scab. And as the picture here sort of demonstrates, um, the animals rub on fence posts, branches, wherever they can. Um, and by this point, mite numbers are high. So there are a lot of mites in the wool that's being um, shed as they rub, which clearly acts as a way for the parasite to maintain itself and spread to other sheep in the flock. Sheep with clinical scab have also been shown to um, lie down significantly more than unaffected sheep. So that's another way where they lie down. They're leaving bits of wool and mites behind for other sheep to pick up. Here is some um, VIDA data from 2007 to 2011 showing the number of cases of um, sheep scab, lice, and um, cases of uh, samples sent in for ectoparasites and no diagnosis reached. So the sheep scab is in yellow, 
and it's fairly clear January, February, uh, March, so the winter months um, is when most sheep scab is diagnosed, uh, but it is diagnosed throughout the, the year. There are um, still cases being diagnosed in May and June. Lice similarly is very much um, a winter disease, very few cases in the summer. Um, but interestingly, the um, no diagnosis cases uh, continue throughout the year and actually are higher in the summer period. Um, and whether this perhaps reflects uh, mite numbers tend to be lower in the summer when uh, the fleece is shorter. Um, the mites prefer colder, wetter conditions, so they don't like dry conditions. Um, so I certainly think there is scab around in the summer, but maybe it's harder to pick up mites and um, identify them. But I think the other perhaps take home message, message from this graph is that um, in some situations the samples that are submitted to the labs are not diagnostic and that may be the reason um, for no diagnosis that um, the samples haven't been uh, well enough taken really to achieve a diagnosis. So that's something I'm going to talk about. Um, this is the uh, VMD code of practice on the responsible use of medicines on the farm. And I just think it's very pertinent to um, sheep scab control. So farmers should consult their vet when they require the diagnosis of any animal health problem and consult their vet for advice on the most appropriate animal medicines available to treat or prevent disease. And it specifically mentions that a pharmacist or SQP can provide information on the medicines that they can lawfully supply, but that SQPs are not qualified to carry out a critical assessment for the animals. Um, and in my experience, I think it is a, a problem that farmers have itchy sheep. They have a tendency to make their own diagnosis, uh, go to their merchant and ask for some treatment, um, whereas really they should be coming to us for a proper diagnosis. Um, and that's something I think I really will stress because I, I think it's one of the reasons that SCAB is being um, poorly controlled. So in terms of um, trying to make a diagnosis when you are presented with itchy sheep, uh, choosing the right animals to sample is important because within a flock um, that is infected with sheep scab, there will be animals at all different stages of disease, so carrying different numbers of um, scab mites. Some that are just starting, you have very low numbers of mites. Some that are in the clinical phase where there'll be a lot of mites and then some where the lesions are declining and mite numbers are declining. So these animals might have obvious lesions, but very few mites there because um, the animal is eliminating or reducing the um, infestation. So the best animals to sample are those that are showing behavioral signs, like the one on the right, obviously itchy, and um, some signs of wool loss. Um, and although this one on the right you know, hasn't got large areas of wool loss, um, you can see obvious tags here, there is some uh, loss going on. Um, this one on the right actually was just um, some lambs in a field I just happened to drive past and everything was rubbing itself against the, um, the fence or the gate and I don't know whether it was scab or lice and to be honest you can't know just from, from looking at them, it, they could have both. Um, I've got a few slides now just of some pictures of some uh, clinical cases of sheep scab and this um, case on this farm uh, was quite dramatic in that these two groups of lambs were randomly split um, at lambing time, the ewes and lambs, um, but one group were infected with scab and um, the other group weren't and obviously there's a dramatic difference in their um, size. I mean some on this farm were less than 15 kilos, whereas in this group they were probably all at least 35 kilos and a lot of them would have um, graded as fat. But in this particular outbreak, uh, these lambs weren't showing um, a significant degree of wool loss, but obviously um, you can see there's real discoloration of the, the wool because they're so itchy and rubbing themselves. See how that one's always been rubbing with its back leg um, and the staining of the wool there but it has significantly um, affected growth rates. So these were you know, very poor of lambs. Uh, 
I think this is demonstrating here really why you've got a, an animal here that's um, in quite um, advanced stage of disease, quite a large lesion. That's the lesion uh, magnified uh, there. So you can see the scabby, um, quite dry scabby exudate around the edge of the lesion. And these lambs um, showing minimal signs. I think it's evident there is some discoloration of the wool, suggesting that they've been rubbing, uh, but no obvious wool loss. But this was actually a farm um, that I just used to drive past these group of lambs, and I could see that they obviously had a problem, but nothing was happening. So I just called on the farmer and said, uh, was he happy if I investigated it? Um, and he was, and uh, I took some samples, and this particular animal was um, hooching with scab mites. There was no difficulty in finding them. This lamb here was one of a group of um, store lambs that had been purchased about 10 weeks previously, purchased uh, from market from multiple sources. Uh, the farmer asked me to look at this particular lamb because it had arthritis of this elbow here. But when I went to look at the elbow, I saw this area of um, wool loss and scab and exudation here. And it was obviously quite itchy when I was handling it. Um, and that was positive, I took some samples and confirmed a sheep scab. So actually the photos here, that one, the previous one, and even the previous one of the lambs that showed very discoloured fleeces, uh, in none of those cases did the farmers ask me to come and uh, investigate itchy sheep. Um, I think they maybe were aware of it, although in this final case here actually, he said he hadn't really noticed any um, obvious itching, uh, and the other lambs in the group didn't appear to be infested and weren't showing signs, but um, in each case they all had scab, but the farmer hadn't sought any investigation. Uh, this picture, these are um, some pedigree blue texels, so I think it's a, a good illustration that um, sheep scab isn't, doesn't just um, infest uh, poor condition, uh, uh, sort of uh, well, it can affect any sheep, and because uh, the clinical signs are largely due to an inflammatory reaction, an allergic reaction to the presence of the scab mites, fit, healthy sheep in good condition can have just as severe scab lesions as um, poor condition, um, underfed sheep. Um, and this one, uh, this ram here, has lost a large amount of wool from here, and uh, excessive sort of scab formation here around the, the edges of the lesions. So moving on to um, taking good samples. Uh, one of the first things uh, to mention is when you start looking um, at the wool for looking at where you might be going to be um, sampling, where there is some exudate, uh, some scab on the skin, that you may be able to see lice uh, with a naked eye. But if you can, I wouldn't stop there and just say, oh, it's lice, because um, you can get lice and scab concurrently. So even if you can see lice with a naked eye, you still want to be um, continuing taking your samples to check there are no uh, scab mites present. So if it's an animal that has um, no obvious lesions, uh, I was presented uh, shortly before Christmas with um, a U. The farmer said he'd just gone out in the field and he'd noticed this ewe. She was lying down and she was just really digging at her neck uh, with one of her back legs, really um, sort of going for it. And she was purchased that autumn. He'd had her about a couple of months by then. Hadn't noticed anything else itchy, but um, that worried him, so he brought her into the practice. Um, I could see where she'd been rubbing at herself by the um, discoloration of the wool. Uh, but there was minimal lesions to find. I had to really look around till I could find a small area, maybe only the size of a, a 10 pence piece, where there was some um, scab and exudate. So that was obviously the place to sample. Um, that was the uh, point source of the scab infestation. So you, if, you, if you've got an obvious lesion where there's um, wool loss, then you want to be sampling around the edge um, uh, where the wool is, where you've actually got wool, don't sample from the bald bit in the middle, on the edge of the lesion. Um, if there are any bits that look 
um, a bit moist. Uh, sample those because you're more likely to find the mites there in a moist lesion. Uh, where it's dried up, they may well have um, moved on. Um, so that's showing a lesion where there is some wool loss, and you'd want to be sampling uh, from the edge of a lesion where there's some nice um, exudates somewhere around there. Initially, I would pluck some wool from the edge of a lesion, if you have got um, an obvious lesion, pluck it and put it into um, a sealable bag. Make sure when you're plucking the wool that you are including some um, scab material, you can see here, um, in with the wool. So place the wool in a sealable bag, and then also you want to be taking a skin scrape um, to get more of the exudate and scab material. Uh, you may want to, I haven't done it here, but trim some of the wool off first, so you're just getting the scab material and the bottom part of the wool and not the whole of the, the staple. So um, scrape the skin, the blade at right hand course to the skin. Um, you're not scraping very deep, then they're, they're not burrowing mites, they're only on the surface, so you don't really need to um, make the skin bleed. Uh, make your scraping and then put the scab material into a, um, a sealable container, universal. So if you've got those samples, your bag of wool and your um, universal with the scab material, um, those samples are fit to um, send away to a lab, if that's what you're going to do. Uh, if you're sending it to um, AHVLA, um, the cost um, for just microscopic examination uh, is 1835. Uh, if you wanted additional staining, say you're concerned maybe uh, Dermatophilus might be involved, that's an extra for £10.90. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, with the SAC, currently um, examination of wool samples is free. Um, or you can examine the samples in your own practice lab, which is what I would um, generally recommend, really, as a starting point. Especially if um, the sheep's presented to you at the practice, then um, I'd often go and have a look at the wool uh, while the farmer's there. And if you find something they quite like, you should have a, you have a look down the microscope themselves and um, see what you found. So if you've got a dissecting microscope, um, you can get through more wool more quickly. Uh, if you can warm the wool up first, that will encourage the parasites um, to move around, so they make them more um, visible. So you can use your dissecting microscope to try and um, find any parasites. Uh, and it's easy then to see, to um, identify a louse, which is almost certainly going to be a, a biting louse, as this one is, Bovicola ovis, um, or a, a mite. Uh, if there's any concern, I've got some photos in a second, whether the mite is actually a scab mite or a coreoptes mite is the most, um, the one you might mix it up with. Um, you then really want to put the mite um, under a compound microscope so you can look at it at a higher magnification uh, to determine which species it is. So uh, pictures here of the two, on the left is um, Seroptes, these are male mites, and the difference here is in the mouth parts, which are more pointed in the Seroptes, and these um, tubercles here, which are more sort of truncated in um, Coreoptes uh, than in the Seroptes. Um, and it's not that easy to see here, but the other difference is that um, you've got these um, suckers on the end of uh, three-jointed pedicels on the um, seroptes, but the suckers aren't on jointed pedicels on the um, coreoptes mites. Um, I don't think it's all that often, really, that it's it is um, uh, that you you need to be sure of differentiating. But I did have a case uh, last year, some sheep that had been treated with um, cydectin. LA, so 2% uh, moxidectin, and was still itchy, um, and I struggled to find any mites at all, then I did find one, um, but I wanted to be really sure that it was um, a seroptes mite rather than a coreoptes, so situations like that it might be important to know, but um, I think often if you've got classic um, scab lesions um, and you find mites, uh, it's almost certainly gained. 
Sauropteris. Um, if you find nothing in the wool sample, then you've got your uh, skin scrape you can have a look at. Um, and you've got a couple of options really um, as to what um, you do with this. You can just put a bit of the scab material on a slide and macerate it with a bit of um, drop of 10% potassium hydroxide, heat it gently, leave it to the slide to clear for 15 minutes and then look at it under a compound microscope.